You're listening to the Peach Pit. I, uh, James, I need to know how to pronounce your last name. Oh, uh, Steidel. Steidel. You're listening to the Peach Pit. I'm here talking with James Steidel from StopTheSprayBC.com. He's an advocate for ending the glyphosate spray on BC's forests, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to him. James, thank you for taking time to talk to me. Oh, yeah, likewise, Derek. Thanks for inviting me onto the show here and uh, chatting about this important issue. Absolutely. It seems very fitting that I'm talking to you today as uh, right now there are helicopters going right over top of me trying to stop the forest fire that's inching closer to me as we speak. <laughs> yeah, man, that's it's a scary situation. I know we kind of went through the same thing earlier this year. Um, we had a fire about uh, two or three kilometers uh, south of our ranch uh, in Punchal that's kind of between Quinell and Prince George and we got lucky the rain pretty much uh, put it out uh, but if it hadn't rained yeah we were worried that would have spread rapidly and um, the only thing between us and that uh, fire was uh, two pine plantations that they sprayed back in 2010 and they were basically just mostly pine trees and all the aspen fire breaks that were killed and whatever was uh, not killed was contaminated and wasn't growing so there was some aspen there but they're all stunted and and uh not healthy you know not not a not a resilient forest I, I think uh maybe the best way for us to dig into this conversation to start off is just to get some of your background so if you could tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in this subject yeah i i grew up on a on a ranch in the, the north caribou and uh they started um well we had a lot of the pine beetle right so they logged a lot of these uh forests uh, that actually weren't all pine. There's a lot of spruce. There's a lot of aspen and Douglas fir in a lot of the forests around us, and uh, and they mostly replanted pine and spruce. And I actually did a lot of that tree planting when I was younger in the late '90s. And uh, yeah, we we replant them, and I always thought that uh, we were doing a good thing. The whole tree planting, silviculture side of things, and you know, we were replacing the stuff we logged. And I didn't really know that. Um, well, I kind of knew about it, but I never really saw it. I never thought too much about what happened after we tree planted uh in a 10 years afterwards well the aspen because there was aspen there when they logged it a few of them right but the way that forests work is there's going to be a lot more aspen after a disturbance that's just how they grow and you got to have a lot of aspen to have a couple aspen 100 years down the road in that forest so um a lot of these aspen grew up uh, along with the pine and spruce that i planted um a lot of the spruce actually died uh, because they don't like to be growing in the open sun, especially after they got sprayed. Um, yeah, and then they went in and sprayed all these places. And then they started spraying like right up to our property line. So in 2010, they they uh, sprayed right, up, right to the backside of our property line, like a huge cup lock. And we kind of asked them not to, and we didn't want them to spray right next to us. We had honeybees, and they did it anyway. And then that's kind of when this whole thing started. I was just like, this is crazy. You know, especially the next year, and I saw everything dead. I'm like, why are we trying to grow pure pine trees? Like, this is insane. We just had the pine beetle infestation, and we're planting, basically, we're replacing, like, we're making it worse. We're creating conditions for another pine beetle attack that's going to be worse than it was last time around. Uh, so it just intuitively made sense to me that we should get more diversity on the landscape. So I, I thought I'd write an article about it because I was trying to be, like, a freelance journalist, I guess. And that led me down a whole bunch of roads, including uh, um, learning about Suzanne Samard and her research. And she's a big deal now because she wrote a, a book called Finding the Mother Tree that, uh, you know, selling really well. And it's kind of changing the whole conversation around forests and, and our concept of forests, which is basically being uh, the forests are a place of, you know, Darwinian competition between these tree species that's a zero sum game which means you know if one wins the other one loses but we're finding that's not actually the case that uh you know when they when you let both species grow like the aspen and pine together you get uh actually more biomass overall and you also get a forest that's more fire resilient so you know it is it's it, there's obvious benefits to having the aspen like what good is all your pine plantations if they all burn or if they all does, uh, die of a disease. So yeah, I learned all this stuff, talk, uh, trying to write this article and, and uh, you know, talking to Suzanne Samard back in 2010 was just a, 
a game changer because she pointed me on all these directions of research that I followed up on. And I wrote the article. I never got it published. I just kind of pitched it around and nobody was interested in it. Kind of the same problem I still have today. It's a very difficult topic to get covered in in the newspapers. And well, our local paper does a really good job of it. There has been some coverage, but it's it's hard to get people to understand the significance of this war on deciduous in BC and Canadian forestry. So that's kind of the back. That's how I got into this issue. Uh, the article was never published. So then I was like, well, I did all this work. I'm just going to be an activist. Screw it. You know, and uh, kiss the, uh, the journalism aspirations goodbye and just uh, dedicate this side of my life to educating people about the value of deciduous and because it's really, really important and people don't know it. And there, there needs to be a cultural shift in how we look at uh, our forests and how we look at our leafy tree species. Because right now in Canada, we look at them as garbage and nothing but weeds uh, get rid of them. That's got to change. And, and maybe it is a problem with perception or uh, lack of perception, really. I mean, w- by listening to the story, it sounds like you got interested because you actually saw the f- effects happening firsthand all around you. And so that's why you got interested in the subject and started uh, researching and everything like that. Most of us, you know, we go about our daily lives, a forest fire pops up beside us, we get scared, but then they go put it out and we go back to our daily lives, not thinking about it or worrying about all the different factors that could play a part. And uh, so maybe we should fast forward a little bit. How did you meet Herb Martin? Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a, uh, an interesting story because we actually met back in 2010, uh, but we didn't really know each other. We went on a field trip in Prince George to uh, this place called Rosebud with these really old growth uh, Douglas fir. And we kind of chatted a little bit about sort of brushing and silviculture because he, he was a brusher. And then, uh, yeah, we kind of like lost contact. And then I started doing a stop the spray thing. And I, he independently started doing his own stop the spray stuff. Uh, and he was, um, one morning he was on the CBC radio and my friend calls me up and he's like, you got to hear this guy on the radio. He's, uh, he's stealing your thunder. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> doing the exact same stuff you're saying. So I, you know, I looked up the interview. I'm like, holy cow, this guy is, you know, he's on the exact same uh, wavelength. And uh, I couldn't find him anywhere, but uh, I, I tracked him down. And, and then we went and grabbed a, grabbed a burger and a beer. And, and we're like, well, let's just join forces and stuff. Uh, but he's, he has a real uh, strong background in uh, silviculture. He's run brushing crews and he's been a logging supervisor and knows a lot of the history of, of the forestry. Uh, the, the, back to your other point there is how you know, a lot of us don't really see this stuff. And we just kind of you know, worry about it when a fire happens and we go back to normal. Um, you know, I, I didn't really think about it either. And I grew up in the bush. Right. Like I always like appreciated the aspen trees and deciduous, but uh, even for someone like me, I didn't really understand the significance of silviculture and the brushing side of things specifically until it literally was right in front of my face until it was something I could actually literally see the before and after effects because otherwise it was just a place you know a cup block on the side of the road that you're not really paying attention to over the years um so yeah even someone who should and i tree planted on and off for 23 years now you know i've like heavily involved in the forest industry and silviculture and and even i didn't really uh appreciate the significance um but we were everybody really needs to start looking at this because it is widespread man it's it's happening everywhere. They're not spraying around you guys, but they're brushing, they're manual brushing, which is something that we also need to talk about. Uh, maybe we'll get to that in a second, but maybe we should begin with the spray. The thing about the glyphosate spray is I don't understand how it even began in the first place. This began in the 80s, right? Yeah, they started doing research in the 70s and then they approved it for use in Canadian forestry in 1984. And then uh, they started using it uh, quite a bit. So, so um, in, in your experience, before 19, no, sorry, before, go ahead. Yep. Uh, no, go ahead. I was just going to get into some of the intricacies of of forest management, uh, like how how it was divided up. Like I'll just mention this briefly. Before 1987, the provincial government was responsible for reforestation in BC, and uh, you know, like. Uh, the common assumption is government's pretty useless at doing stuff. And just like uh, 
most other things, I guess, they were pretty bad at reforestation where they let a lot of these plantations kind of grow naturally, which in my, in my mind was actually good. So I'm glad that they kind of didn't do a good job. Uh, but in 87, they, uh, you know, along with this global trend of like Thatcherism and Reaganomics, they kind of wanted to privatize a lot of stuff. So they privatized the forest management and they gave the responsibility for reforestation to the corporations. And that happened in 1987. And after that, things got really, really bad. Like they just basically started spraying and brushing everything and, and just kind of implementing this totalitarian uh, monocrop vision upon the landscape. And that really kicked in in 87. And you can see the statistics show how much worse the plantations have gotten since then, like way less diversity now than before 1987. But, it, but anyway, yes, sorry to cut you off. That's just, that's just the real quick Coles Notes history of, of what happened. Well, in, in researching the history and how it all began, you must have heard lots of arguments in favor of the glyphosate spray. So I thought in, in to play devil's advocate here for a second, what would you say is the best argument in favor of the spray that you have ever heard and quickly blow it out of the water for us? Oh, well, it's, it's, a, it's an accounting argument. And that's basically what modern forestry is. It's accounting. It's not based on ecosystem science. It's based on uh, how to sustain your harvest levels uh, by growing trees as quickly as you possibly can. That's right? insane. So, it's, it's, uh, but the forest, so now they're looking at it as a, a cash crop, like a product. Absolutely. That's the whole history. That's the history of forestry. It's got started in the 1700s in Germany, uh, where, you know, the, the Prussian king there wanted to know how much they could log uh, without um, compromising, you know, his, uh, the here's ability to harvest and generate revenue. So they did scientific studies of how fast the trees were growing and and that would tell them how much they could harvest today. And so it's basically the whole history is is accounting, for lack of a better term. And that's the primary argument for spraying today, is that it juices up the yield projections so that you can harvest more today. It's all about getting as much timber as you possibly can today. And this all feeds into these computer models that they have down in Victoria. And if you didn't spray, um, you know, the yield of today would have to go down based on the model projections and you would have to tell the companies to harvest less today. So that's, that's the best argument for, for why they spray. It's just an entirely theoretical uh, accounting game that's being played and spraying is critical to that game, right? It's not, it's not based on reality. It's not based on uh, risk assessments. It's not based on the fact that we're losing a lot of these plantations to fire today. And it's not based on the possibility that these trees we're spraying might have an economic value uh, in the future. Right? So, yeah, it's the, the entire argument is just to make the, the conifer trees grow as quickly as you possibly can make them grow. Uh, forget about ecological succession. Forget about uh, this deciduous trees in the forest. Uh, forget about all the species that depend on that stage of the forest's life. Uh, forget about fire resistance. Forget about carbon sequestration. All that stuff doesn't matter. There's one goal that we are implementing upon the landscape, and that is maximize revenue for these big multinational corporations so that they can cut as much as they possibly can today. And and so these... Uh, and I, don't I, I don't know if I need to blow that out of the water. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just greed, right? It's a It's a greedy... Um, philosophy that is being implemented and it, it makes economic sense, I guess, if you're only worried about money in life, but uh, I don't even think it makes economic sense. Not if you factor in all the, all the problems we're having with these, with these plantations. Absolutely. And uh, not to mention all of the research that we're ignoring, right? Like mountains of research showing that this really isn't helping. <laughs> like, oh uh, yeah. Ton like the, is that and they're yeah. ignoring it all right it seems like like uh they're, they're trying to say that this is supposed to help uh conifer trees but this actually hasn't even helped conifer trees has it well they've, they've got some studies that they're convinced uh you know they're doing some very specific studies where they've removed deciduous and the pine trees grow quicker 
uh, and I'll admit it, I I go and look at these these blocks they sprayed. The pine trees are growing really really well, you know. So if you look at little microscopic instances of where you've done this practice, and the trees are growing quicker, then uh, they're right. But if you look at the landscape level and what happens when every single plantation is a single tree species, plantation after plantation after plantation, there's no old growth left, there's no deciduous left, it's all just a gigantic landscape of even age pine trees. Like, are they, you, you really start to wonder um, if there's anything upstairs there, if there's any kind of uh, comprehension going on in the, uh, the higher ups, if there's any kind of, like what kind of qualifications they have to be getting paid public dollars for what they're doing. Like, it seems to me they're completely incompetent and idiotic. And yet these are our chief foresters and our deputy chief foresters and our district managers. They're all making this decision, these decisions. And they're all making sure that this vision has been implemented on the landscape. And we pay these guys like six figure salaries. Yeah. Um, so it, it doesn't answer, really seem like answer your question. Are they, they think they, they think they know what they're doing, but they, they have no evidence, uh, to really uh, believe that it's um, going to work on a, on a large scale that they think it's going to work. Right. And it's, it's really just about corporate interest at the end of the day. It seems like it's just ignoring science. And meanwhile, we, like we have contaminated blueberries, starving moose, uh, herbicide signs put up in the forest, but you know, animals don't know how to read. Yeah. So <laughs> man, I just, it, the, the more you look into it, I've been doing this for, for 10 years now, 11 years. And it's just absolutely uh, sickens me that our society has gone along with this for so long and is still going along with it. Especially considering the new things that we're learning. Like we're learning that this stuff doesn't go away. That glyphosate will persist in the vegetation for uh, 12 years. They found uh, contamination. Right, and they put on the sign se not 72 hours. <laughs> Yeah, the sign says stay out of there for 72 hours, but the next year there's going to be glyphosate in the surviving berries. Uh, you have a one in four chance of the glyphosate being higher than what um, is allowed in grocery stores. And, uh, you know, grocery stores, they've done a big survey of fruit and vegetables and 0% of the samples, they did like 6,000 samples or 4,000 samples, 0% had glyphosate in them at all. They're above 0.1 part per million. Uh, 26% of the samples in these sprayed blocks had levels higher than 0.1 part per million, which is the default level allowed for vegetables and fruits. So we're contaminating our backcountry with the stuff. And you guys are lucky down there. They don't really spray all that much, but in Prince George, they spray everything. It's like this year, 100% of the interior spraying was in Prince George. Uh, if you look at the map of, of all the historical spraying, like they've, they've blasted our area. It's insane, like in every direction, and they're still doing it. And we still need to get to like uh, the the aspen being where the nesting birds like to go more than the majority of the time. Uh, aspen also sequestering more CO two and pumping out more oxygen. <laughs> Broadleaf species forests are also not seen as a fuel source. Yeah, which yeah. I, you want to you want to talk about that right now? Yeah, we should get into that. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, so um, just did a little presentation there at uh, down in Quinell on the weekend, and it's called the Amazing World of Aspen, and this is kind of getting into a whole different part of uh, the conversation, not just about life state contamination and um, you know the the whole uh, idea that we've got to just grow conifer monocrops and stuff. This is actually about the value of the thing we're getting rid of, and challenging the idea that these trees that we're uh, eliminating, not just with glyphosate, but with brush saws, are like worthless uh, weeds. So my presentation is called The Amazing World of Aspen, and I kind of cover all these crazy things about aspen trees that, that we as a society haven't really been taught. Uh, you know, I grew up in a lumber town, and we did a lot of forestry education in school, in elementary school and uh, high school, and we never learned anything about aspen trees. You know, like, I think maybe in outdoor education, we learned that maybe, maybe some birds lived in them, but I don't really, even really remember that being stressed all that much. So everything that I've learned 
and that I cover in this presentation is stuff that I've, you know, researched on my own. And uh, maybe one day we can do a presentation down in the Peachland or something. <laughs> That'd be uh, perfect. Yeah, we can do an outdoor venue or something because it looks like COVID's going to be around with us forever. Um, which is what we did down a weekend. We didn't, did uh, at the amphitheater there at uh, 10 Mile Lake. It was a lot of fun, actually. Uh, so, yeah, these, these aspen trees. And, you know, it, the same kind of stuff uh, goes for birch as well um, and cottonwood. Is they're really fast-growing trees. That's why we get rid of them is because they're considered a weed because they have this phenomenal growth rate. And this growth rate is actually unparalleled by any tree species anywhere at our latitude around the globe. So they're the quickest growing woody tissue that we have, which means they sequester the most carbon. Uh, every single study that's looked at it has confirmed that aspen sequester more carbon than any other tree species in less time. Uh, they just uh, came out with a study in April in the, uh, up in Alaska after a forest fire. They found that uh, where the aspen and birch was growing, they, it sequestered 400% more carbon than the spruce. Uh, so that's just phenomenal, right? We're not yeah, talking about yeah. super points. We're talking about exponentially more carbon being sequestered in these, in these deciduous forests. Um, and it's not just the uh, carbon sequestration. If you, uh, you know, as everybody knows, when you're you know, walking barefoot on the pavement, you want to walk on the white strips because it's going to be a lot uh, cooler on your feet than the the fresh blacktop because the darker color absorbs more heat. Uh, it's the same way with our forests. And if you look at a hillside, you'll the aspen and birch will stick out because they're way lighter in color. Right. This means they don't absorb as much heat. And it, that's also very significant. Um, uh, conifers absorb almost twice as much heat. Their albedo value is almost twice as uh, low. The albedo is the amount the tree reflects. The aspen's uh, albedo value is almost twice as much as uh, as conifer. So if you have a landscape of deciduous, it's going to absorb way less heat than a landscape of conifer. And of course, we're getting rid of the trees that absorb the least amount of heat to grow the trees that absorb the most heat. Um, you know, for for starters. Uh, so you've got the uh, carbon sequestration. You've got the higher albedo value. And to top it all off, well, there's, there's other factors beyond these three, but the third one is fire resistance. And that's the, the aspen is, uh, and the birch, they're incredibly fire resistant. And this has to do with a few things. Um, you know, they don't have uh, resin or pitch that's flammable, and they, they have way more water in their, in their tissue. Now, one of the common assumptions is that aspen kind of like they take over the wet sites in the forest. And, uh, you know, they hog all the good productive sites. That's why we got to get rid of them and give the conifers a chance to grow because these things will actually hog all the good spots. But actually, that's totally nonsense. I mean, sure, they do like to grow in some bottom areas, but they also grow on hillsides. And the area around the aspen is going to be damper, more moist, and have more nutritious soil, not because of that's what the site was before the aspen was there, but because the aspen created that. Uh, the aspen uh, allow way more snow through the canopy. Okay, so if you ever walk through an aspen forest in the winter, you're up to your knees in the snow, and as soon as you get into a conifer stand, uh, there's no snow. The snow all got trapped in the needles and sublimated or, or blew away. Uh, and the same thing happens in the summer. Way more rain uh, penetrates the canopy of an aspen forest to the, reach the forest floor than in a conifer forest. Uh, in one study in Colorado, there's actually negative rainfall interception, which means more rain was reported underneath the aspen than what, what fell out of the sky. Wow. So it, act it actually created a, its own rain. And I don't really know how or why, but probably condensation on the leaves and it dripped down from there. Uh, yeah, so, you know, when you walk through a forest, all of a sudden you get into an aspen stand, it's way cooler, it's way damper, it's way more moist. And that's because those trees, the architecture of the forest, just basically sucked in more water. They're like straws in the, in the forest. They, they allow the water to get to the forest floor. And then there's, their soil is also richer in humus, and it's more biologically active. And this all absorbs more moisture and hangs on to moisture better. So that's why, that's why the aspen don't burn as much, is because they are basically gather more water the rest of the year, and they hang on to that water better. 
it, it seems to like this comes back to the idea that for some reason there are some people who think that they're smarter than mother nature and mother nature needs to be guided by us but you know i was just watching the documentary fantastic fungi have you ever heard of paul stamets and uh he was talking about no, uh the mycelia of the the mushrooms how they connect trees even of different species and they'll send the nutrients and th the mushrooms will even decide to make a clearing in a spot of the forest it seems like we're just trying to create a monocrop instead of letting the forest do what it does naturally in its own biodiversity is always going to be better when it comes to doing a cut block maybe we should get into brushing first because uh, i don't know that much about brushing yeah oh just just to touch on your point there about the about the fungal networks uh, aspen actually is associated with more species of fungi than than uh, other conifers uh they haven't really measured with pine but uh subalpine fir and um and black spruce, trembling aspen has way more mycorrhizae associations. Uh, they've done a study on where they've discovered that aspen actually associates with uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae, and these are two two of a few important classes of mycorrhizae uh, that most plants can only associate with one or the other, and aspen can associate with both. So basically, aspen has a more uh, a much more diverse and capable army of fungi helping it out wow. to gather nutrients from it. And the aspen roots also go quite a bit deeper than most conifer root systems. And that's also how they can partner with different uh, mycorrhizae. So, you know, having aspen in your forest, that those, uh, those mycorrhizae can literally unlock minerals out of, out of rock. And that will yeah. end up in the tissue of the aspen tree. Then the aspen tree falls down and rots. And now all of a sudden you have a bunch of minerals on the, the surface of the forest for the spruce, the spruce to tap into. It's a whole system, right, that, that's developed over millions and millions of years. And we think we can make it better, like you say, by just getting rid of <laughs> the aspen and growing forest like a carrot field. Like, you know, trees aren't carrots. They're way more complex. There's way more stuff going on. That and uh... we have no clue about to this day. It's on. Uh, and here we are growing pine plantations everywhere. Like, man, we're we're in for a huge, huge rude awakening. Not just with these fires, but uh, you know, with disease as well is gonna is gonna start to be a problem. Um, I'm seeing a lot of pine trees around uh, Prince George with red needles that I haven't seen in the last few years. So they might have gotten a little bit of a a rust infection. It might not be fatal, but you know, it might be signs of uh, of things to come or a needle blight or whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, so yeah, we, we look at the forest as a farm and, you know, glyphosate is one tool that farmers use that we've applied to forests. And the other tool is brushing where you physically cut down the aspen and birch. Usually with brush saws, but you also go in and girdle them where you uh, kind of slice off the bark around the base of the tree if it's a bigger tree and that will kill the tree. And yeah, we're doing that uh, all over British Columbia, anywhere the deciduous is growing. And there's actually a really uh, sadly uh, hilarious news broadcast out of Kamloops uh, by the journalist Adam Donnelly there from about two weeks ago. Yeah, we did a post on Stop the Spray BC, but it was, uh, it was like a, a feel-good positive news story about um, a government-funded program basically teaching kind of hard to employ uh, kids out of the criminal justice system uh, how to fight wildfires right and then the journalist goes to this uh, location where they're getting trained and they're not learning how to fight wildfires they're learning how to run a brush saw and they're cutting down fire resistant deciduous in this plantation yeah i kid you not man and it's all it's like no the, the journalist does not mention whatsoever what they're doing that this has nothing to do with fighting wildfires it's all just, uh, oh, look at this awesome uh, work program, getting these kids working. And they're in there. Uh, they're, it's right near the Tremont fire, right? And they're, they're talking about the, being impacted by the fires. And one of the kids is like, you know, I read about it every day in the news. When I wake up, I smell the fire, you know, and I just want to be out here protecting my community. And then the next shot, it cuts to, the, cuts to a shot of them, like, hacking down all these aspen and birch trees. So, Sanity. yeah, we're brushing... This isn't just a Prince George, Northern BC thing. We're doing the same thing all through British Columbia. Okay, we're doing it in your area. We're doing it in the hills above Penticton. 
uh, we're doing it around uh, the Monte Creek fire or the White Rock Lake fire there. Tons of areas were brushed on the northern flank of that fire, there's tons of brush plantations. Some of those plantations were brushed uh, five times. So they, they cut, it, cut all the aspen and birch down once and it would grow back. They'd go back, cut it down again, and again, and again, and again. Like it's relentless. Like they were so fixated on growing these pine plantations that we will literally shoot ourselves in our own feet right. and screw over communities and then expose communities to risk of fire and yeah. we'll still do it even with smoke in the sky even when you're breathing the smoke from these fires we're still doing it like that is complete insanity like how stupid are we you know i watch this stuff i'm like i, I shouldn't be so harsh because you know what if uh, probably 12 years ago i probably wouldn't have taken a second thought about that um so we're all we're all uh we're all responsible for this. And I was too, at one point, you know, I, I totally bought into the idea of brushing and growing pine tree plantations. And it's just the importance of, of education and learning, right? It's like, I don't see it that way anymore because I know better. And so the question is, how do we get people to uh, learn this stuff? And it's really important for, you know, you to be doing this, these kind of shows and hats off to you, Derek, for, thank you for, you know, being interested in this topic and having me on a talk about it. And, and I hope that this will spark conversations in other areas and we can start like a, a snowball effect here to get change happening. Absolutely. That's one, that's one of the reasons I do my little presentation is also to get people talking about this. And it's just amazing how many people grew up in the bush in British Columbia and they don't even, and they don't know it. Right. And not just like whites like me, but also even indigenous uh, communities, you know, like we've, we've forgotten so much. And we're not, and we're not being, we're not being encouraged to learn it because our society, our society is so controlled by these big corporations that yes. are fixated on conifer planting that they don't, uh, they're not like the council of forest industries. That's a huge corporate lobby group that invests a significant amount of money into childhood education. Okay. They have programs for elementary schools, high schools, uh, they're not teaching kids that deciduous is fire resistant. I'll tell you that much. Right. That's something they're not kids, right? What are they teaching them? They're teaching them about forestry. They're teaching them about forest management and basically uh, hoodwinking the, the public from a young age into thinking that everything is being well looked after out in the landscape. And right. it's totally like, like what's, what is happening is an unmitigated crime against our children, against our communities, against wildlife. Uh, and and it's and it's still going full steam ahead. I would like to uh, maybe get towards uh, talking about the future of like what sustainable forestry would actually look like. But before we get to that, I would like to just kind of ask you a little bit about because we've been hearing in the news about uh, on the island how they've been cutting down old growth trees inside of the forest there, and there's been a a lot of controversy around it. Some people like going and you know uh, barricading making barricades other people getting mad at the barricades because they're worried about their jobs i was wondering if you want to weigh in on that oh absolutely um oh i've got opinions about all this stuff Derek. <laughs> all week we can chat for hours and hours and hours and one of the important things that's been forgotten in this old growth protest and what is never mentioned very rarely mentioned is that we used to have a hundred thousand direct forestry jobs in this province and 20 years ago. Okay. We're down to 50,000 jobs now. And kind of depending on the data source, uh, the harvesting, the amount that we've harvested every year has either stayed the same as 20 years ago, or it's actually gone up. Okay. So our workforce has been cut in half and the harvesting has either gone up or stayed the same. And nobody talks about that. Okay, so, you know, these, these, uh, these tree huggers are a threat to jobs. Give me a break. Okay, they, they do not pose a threat to jobs. And if they do, they're far less of a threat to jobs than rapacious capitalism that has automated mills and thrown tens of thousands of people out of work uh, right. to pad the bottom of these megacorps. 
right? Like in Prince George is like so many good examples here. We've lost, uh, we've lost over a thousand direct mill jobs in Prince George. Okay, there's still tons of just as much as getting cut now as it ever was. Where did all these jobs go? Uh, so I grew up working in a place called Clear Lake, which was a small mill, which is its claim to fame was uh, to be the most inefficient mill in British Columbia. <laughs> uh, every board was touched by. Yeah, but we it made money. It made money up until the day Canfor closed it down. And there was a trailer park there where people lived or that raised families there and they all got kicked out. Everybody got evicted. They basically just snuffed the town out off the map. You know, it had like a couple hundred people lived there and it just everybody had to leave. And all the production got shifted to Polar, which is a super mill in Bear Lake. And the production there is 10 times as much as what Clear Lake could ever do. So Clear Lake did about 10 logging truck loads a shift. Okay. And they, they employed 364 people. This new mill does 100 logging truck loads a shift. And it employs, a, we don't know the exact numbers, but we're going to say to be generous, 150 people. Okay, so it's it's half the it's half the employees, not being generous, it's probably less than that. It's half the employees and ten times the production. So there you go. So anybody that's worried about jobs is full of crap. Okay, they're if they're worried about jobs, they would have shut down uh, these big super mills. They would have opposed uh, the BC Liberals getting rid of the local jobs, local logs for local mills requirement. You know, that was required. You had to cut, you had to process your trees at the local mill up until 2003. And then the, the BC Liberals, Kevin Falcon was probably behind it. He's running for the BC Liberal leadership. He uh, and whoever else, Rich Coleman, with, you know, these other people that don't care about communities, uh, they got rid of that requirement so that all the logs could be shipped to super mills. And then that paved the way for closing all these small mills. Uh, so the biggest... The biggest threat to jobs is, is all these huge corporations um, cutting costs, cutting jobs to maximize shareholder value, right? Like a couple of valleys, like a small amount of old growth is going to threaten jobs to the extent that these corporations have. Give me a break. No, that's not even close to being true. Uh, so that's what I'm going to say about the, the uh, Ferry Creek protesters. And then the narrative is completely off base. You know, and anybody that uh, is opposing these guys because of jobs is a complete hypocrite because I guarantee you they said nothing when all these small mills were closed by these big corporations. Absolutely. And it makes a lot of sense of not, don't point the finger at the guy at the top, point the finger at each other and keep fighting with each other because divide and conquer is the name of the game. Uh, I just wanted to get more into the, so the, if this is Ferry Creek we're talking about. Are they actually going in, cutting down trees that are really old? Or is this all kind of hype? Well, I'm not I'm not there to see it. Uh, it, it looks like they're really old uh, trees. Um, you know, the pictures at the four and thousands of years old. Uh, there might be some smaller stuff in there that gets that gets cut, you know, and they're doing kind of crappy clear cut practices. That's something else we got to move away from. We've got to do selective logging. Okay, so let's talk about uh, that. But they're just, you know, yeah. Not sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off yeah, there, but that sounds totally like a really good subject. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. Selective logging is, is the way of the future. And uh, one of the biggest loggers in Prince George, uh, Freya, that's... Uh, he's committed to it you know he's trying to make it work and and he can make money doing it the logging industry will not collapse if we do selective logging there's just going to be less money for jimmy pattison okay can for earn <laughs> four billion. oh seriously they can for earn four billion dollars so far this year right and they're still gonna but now that they're not making as much money as they did over the summer they're gonna shut mills down like over the next month because four billion uh, they're, you know, because they're not making as much of a profit as they as they have so far. Like it's completely sick what Jimmy Pavison is able to get away with, and the media in the Lower Mainland just worships this guy. Like, look at what Keith Baldry says about him, and and uh, well, even the CBC uh, recently, Gloria MacRanko interviewed Jimmy Pavison. It was just the biggest. Uh, 
puff uh, piece. What the word is, but yeah, there's just the puff piece, right? There's no tough questions for Jimmy. There never is. He's he's considered a, a great British Columbian, right? Okay, but he's like destroyed jobs and he's small, um, and he creates a culture within these corporations that he runs that actually makes them awful places to work. Nobody likes working account for. They're terrible places. Uh, you know, he, uh, ever since his days as a used car salesman, he used fear, right? Like if you were, whoever sold the least amount of cars, they get fired uh, every month. It's the same thing that he does with, uh, with his corporations. Like people are always worried, worried about their jobs. Um, you know, and he screws over everybody as much as he can. So if you're a, a logging truck driver, you've got to wait like 90 days to get paid. And if you want to get paid quicker, you have to knock 10% off your invoice. Like that's just standard Patterson procedure, right? And then he runs like a monopoly on the the, the medium sized grocery stores in Prince George, Save On. Like it's just it's just pretty crazy how this guy can get away with basically monopolizing and corrupting the free market of all these regional economies and making us worse off. But yet the big media in British Columbia doesn't say a word about it, and they let him get away with it. But anyway, back to the selective logging thing. <laughs> um, you know, we could we could do selective logging, but but Jimmy Patterson isn't going to let that happen, right? So, That's more expensive. That's less money. At the bottom line, he's not going to do selective logging, and they don't. Canfor is the worst. Canfor does the worst. Has the worst logging practices. Uh, they do all the spraying. Uh, they've got the worst mills to work at. Like it's an awful, awful company. What, what in your mind, if we were to finally do this all right, if we got rid of the glyphosate spray, we stopped doing the brushing, what would uh, sustainable forestry look like? Well, you'd have to also get rid of these big corporations, get rid of West Fraser, get rid of Canfor. And to be honest, they already have one foot out the door. Like they, their model isn't going to, their model depends on the rapacious pillaging of massive landscapes of primary forest. And when those, when all, when all the primary forest is gone, they're not going to have a profitable business model anymore. They're, they're going to, like all that billions of dollars that they earn this year, they're not investing that in BC. They're buying mills in other parts of the world, right? They've bought all these mills in, in the US South. They've bought uh, mills in Sweden. I think they have more capacity outside of Canada now than inside Canada. Uh, so so they, they already see the writing on the wall, right? This is, it's not a sustainable model they have here. And they're just going to log it as quickly as they possibly can and make the most money as they possibly can. And then they're going to hit the road and kick us all to the curb, just like they did to the small mills and other communities around the interior. Uh, so it, it's just a matter of time before they're gone. I think we need to kick them out now. They've broken their end of the bargain. Like they're, they're, they have Near to public timber, but it's not smart enough to do this. But uh, the unspoken gentleman's agreement was we give them public timber, but they would I think I'm kind of losing connection with you. It's hard to hear anything you're saying. Society and our communities with benefits like jobs and they've uh, uh, should lose those licenses. Then, you know, going to pay the logging truck drivers on time that are able to, uh, they will have to be good places to work because. You know, there's going to be other small companies that people can go work at. And there's going to be competition uh, before she be shut down. Like there should be antitrust legislation brought to bear against these monopsonies uh, because they are distorting the free market in our community. And they've been doing that for decades. So to me, a sustainable forest industry is one where you've got a bunch of different actors, a bunch of different companies and a bunch of different products, right? Right now, it's all just geared to two by fours. And that's it. Uh, so we're very, it's a very volatile market. Uh, we could be doing stuff with deciduous like birch and aspen can be made into paneling and, and furniture products. You know, if you have a diverse forest, you're going to have a diverse 
forest economy. And what we're doing is we have a, we don't have a diverse industry and we are converting the forest into something that is not diverse either to match the fact I think I'm losing connection with you. It's having a hard time hearing what you're saying. I think we uh, we got to start. We need to flip that on its head and diversify the industry, diversify the forests. Uh, we would have more jobs, there'd be more work, and there'd be more wildlife. Let's, for, let's not forget, it's not just about the industry, it's about uh, cattle ranching, right? Cattle, there's more grazing. Okay, can you hear me? Go there. Yeah, I can hear you. Go there. Now. Hello. Yeah. Hello. I Hello. We might need to wrap this up soon. So I'd like to just ask you, uh, is there anything else that you think that you'd like to say for people to do? Uh, obviously, we want people to go to stopthesprayBC.com. Uh, what else would you urge people to do? Uh, well, we need to get on the, the phone with the district forester. And I was just going to say, and a chief forester in Victoria, and I think just before I got cut off, I think it's just important to remember, it's not just about timber values that we need. We need our forests to serve other things as well, like... Uh, ecosystem services uh, in general, but also, you know, cattle ranching depends on deciduous forests more than conifer forests. Uh, foraging for berries, that's more of a deciduous ecosystem type thing. Uh, the guide outfitters that are doing, like, you know, people might not agree with hunting, but it's an important generator of tourist dollars in northern BC. They depend on that, those diverse forests that isn't timber values, right? It's, it's wildlife values. Uh, trappers, hunters, foragers, mushroom pickers, all that stuff uh, is not about timber values. It's about having a diverse forest um, that's not just there, it's, that's not just um, pine plantation. So I think that's the kind of message we need to send to the Ministry of Forests is that is that we need to protect these other values in the landscape. And we're focusing way too much on what these big corporations want and need and not enough on what the other parts of our society want to need. Um, so send letters to the chief forester, that's Diane Nichols. Uh, Shane Berg is the deputy chief forester, the deputy minister, I forget his name, but the Katrine Conroy's of the world and before her was Doug Donaldson. These politicians never have any power. They're, uh, they're controlled by the bureaucracy. It's a situation where the bureaucrats are, are professional foresters and they have created the impression that they are the experts and that they need to be listened to uh, in the sense that they're apolitical, like an apolitical doctor or something. You know, you don't argue with the doctor and you don't argue with the forester, but that's not the case. Foresters are entirely political. Okay, they're making political decisions. When they decide to get rid of Aspen and Birch, that's a political decision they're making. And the politicians need to take, uh, take that back from the bureaucracy. And we need politicians to be making political decisions, not unelected bureaucrats. And unfortunately, that's what we have right now. Uh, I think that was really well put. And I think that's a great way to wrap up this conversation for now. Uh, James, I want to thank you again so much for taking time to talk to me. Everyone, this is James Steedle from www.stopthespraybc.com. Once again, I'd like to strongly urge anyone listening to this to go to Stop the Spray BC com to learn more about this subject. James, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me. And what I usually say to my guests is that hopefully we'll talk again in the future. To you, I'll say hopefully we won't have to talk again in the future. Yeah, me too, Derek. Uh, although that was uh, that was a lot of fun, you know. Yeah. And uh, but keep in touch. Maybe we do a little Aspen presentation down there one day. That would be great. I would love that. So keep in touch. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye bye.